Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Um, can you all hear me? Is my voice clear? Yes. Great. Uh, so first, I would like to ask you to please uh, not take photos or oh, sorry. No. Yeah. So <laughs> do not take photos or videos during the performance lecture. And uh, basically, I will I will uh, walk you through my research on the production, circulation, and consumption of images of uh, victims and images of violence, generally. Specifically, doc documentary images. I will start by explaining what you see uh, in these drawings. Some of you have seen them. And if you haven't, you can, after the performance lecture, you can take a closer look and uh, peek at the photographs behind them. So these drawings, they are actually tracings of uh, stills of six different videos. All of these videos, they document the same event, but from multiple points of view. You can see also a close-up of these tracings. Uh, in Beirut, Lebanon, in 2021, October, uh, clashes happened in the streets of the city between two political armed parties. One is Hezbollah and the other one is the Christian forces known as al quwat These clashes have caused many um, deaths, fear, horror, chaos, some entertainment and uh, so many images. And these images circulated. One special scene was documented by many cameras at the same time. And this scene is of a Hezbollah fighter holding a rocket launcher, RBG-7. He runs to the middle of the street to shoot his rocket towards an opposing building where a sniper is located. And most likely the sniper is from al quwat but right before the Hezbollah fighter shoots his rocket, he gets shot by so many different cameras from all sides, which causes his death. And he died right next to the street sign, past either side. So which eye killed the victim or the criminal? The camera, since the beginning of photography, has a curse attached to it, which is that it's something that represents reality as it is. And to a certain extent, this is true, because a camera works somehow similar to how a human eye works by receiving the light that is reflected towards its lens. And the camera, in social situation of violence, it usually takes two different positions. One, it can be the perpetrator or the, a weapon where the presence of a camera can kill somebody by simply shooting the subject in front of the lens or by stripping them out of their context. Uh, or it can even kill the person who's filming uh, themselves. Like we can see in the work of Rabi Amruwe and part of his work, uh, uh, Pixelated Revolution, where the person filming the soldier, this happened in Syria at the time of the protests, uh, the person who's filming the soldier is completely indulged and immersed in the screen that he does not acknowledge the danger he is in when the soldier is directing his weapon towards the lens. So when the soldier is having eye contact basically with the, with the person filming. The person continue filming, the soldier shoots, the person dies and the video ends. The other position of the camera can be a protector or a shield where the presence of a camera can prevent a crime from happening. And in these both ways, the camera is an active actor or participator in this social situation of violence that aims to change or to impact this uh, situation. So it's something like uh, the camera is a double-edged sword. But most people use the tip of the sword to stab and cause a higher damage.
We can understand the step of the sword as the third position of a camera in a social situation of violence that uh, stabs reality and start leaking fiction into it. This fiction gets mixed with violence and this mix gets captured by yet another documenting camera. Or we can understand the step of the sword as the third position of a camera that is seemingly neut uh, neutral uh, position that is objective reading of a situation. So the camera as truth-telling machine or as a reality transporting machine. And that is, uh, so it, it's a form in the absolute with no ideology attached to it, and that is called documentary. It's a false form of truth that manages to keep the false quality as sober footage, unedited, unmanipulated, uncontextualized, unscripted, where pure reality tells itself. In the age of uh, mass digital media consumption, the image and specifically the documentary image of victims or violence becomes a commodity. And like any other commodities, the user or the consumer has a big influence on the production process. And because it's an economy, so there is a competition. And violence, of course, is unlike oil, for example. Violence is an unlimited resource. So you can keep producing uh, this commodity. And of course, victims will not consume their own images. Therefore, the images of victims and violence that are produced mostly in, for example, Syria, Libya, Lebanon, Yemen, etc., they are shipped through mega media companies and social media to the West to be consumed by mostly Western citizens middle class and globally upper class citizens. So my question is why, why there is a high demand on this commodity and how is it consumed and what need does it fulfill? Why there is a um, big demand on it? This image originally is not blurry, I blurred it because it's very explicit and uh, uh, clearly the people documented did not give a permission uh, to circulate this image. Uh, this film, maybe some of you have seen it, if not it's a, a British uh, a film actually that is directed by British director funded by uh, Britain and filmed in Syria. Uh, this is another similar documentary uh, that is uh, funded by the Danish government and directed by a Danish director, also filmed in Syria. And this is a, a famous documentary, The White Helmets. It's an Oscar winning uh, documentary that is also directed by British director um, and was filmed in Syria. So to answer this question of why there is a high demand on such commodity, uh, Jill Godmelo may have an answer for that. Um, so I would like to quote, she calls these images uh, social pornography. Uh, pornography of the real is the objectifying of a graphic image, turning it from a subject into object, so that the thing or the person depicted can be commodified, circulated, and consumed without regard to its status as a subject. Pornography of the real is the documentary's exploitation of real-life situations to produce that titillation of difference, which middle-class citizens, and I would add Western citizens, seem to need and enjoy. So it gives that sympathy feeling that is motivated by and flirts with supremacy. This pornographic exploitation of the real encourages the viewers to peek at the devastated, the distorted, the dispossessed, and the daringly and dramatically different to then say, thank God, it's not me. 
And peeking is very important here because peeking is not like looking. Peeking is looking at something or someone without them knowing that you are looking. So how to increase the value of images and therefore the value of victims themselves that are represented? We might need to make them invisible. Around a year ago, I was reading the thesis of my friend, Yara Said, and in a, a chapter that is titled uh, Distance as Habitual Scrolling on Screens and Watching the World from Afar, I discovered that there is a European law, I don't know if, if some of you know, there is an actual European law that prevents individuals, institutions, journalists, of circulating and publishing images of Western victims, whether they are victims of uh, terrorist attacks, um, natural disasters, or even accidents. All of these images, they are uh, invisible and they only are present in courtrooms to serve as confidential ev evidence. And uh, most institutions and art spaces, for example, that prohibit showing these images, because it is illegal, uh, they usually show Im pretty explicit images of other victims and violent images from different countries, usually to raise awareness or to raise donations. But my question is, why are Western victims invisible? Do they not exist? Of course, they do exist. But if we want to understand that in um, an economic way, which is the most relevant when talking about the image as a commodity, it's simply because these images cannot be objectified, they cannot be commodified, and they cannot be circulated and consumed. Because, of course, we know that victims will not consume their own images. So there is no high demand on, on these kind of images, and therefore their economic value is not necessarily worth to deal with as a commodity, and therefore it's judged by different values, such as moral values of privacy and consent. But if images of um, Western victims are invisible, there is a lack of representation, and visibility sometimes might equal existence. And usually this representation gets covered by, for example, fiction films, where you see many explicit images of uh, usually white victims. And uh, this representation gets extended and stretched to uh, what's called the true crime documentaries, which is very much a fictional form of storytelling that is based on real life, not only stories, but real life footage. And that's where these images can find a legal way to be commodified through narrative and entertainment. And uh, usually the suggestion of making documentary images of victims invisible is a bit dangerous because visibility equals uh, existence, but at the same time visibility equals danger like what we see in the work of How Not to Be Seen by British artist group Monty Python. If you're visible in a field or uh, um, if you're visible, you, you are uh, exposed to danger and therefore you will get shot or killed. And in How Not to Be Seen by Hito Styrel, she offers many ways to be invisible for a camera uh, for sake of protection, of course. And one specific method she offers is very uh, interesting, I think, which is um, to become the image, if you want to be invisible. So to become the form itself. And in this way, you stop being represented and you start to be representing. So the image is not representing the people, but the image and the people are representing fear, uh, chaos, weakness, etc. So it's okay. <laughs> it's fine. 
So back to this scene a bit. I started doubting the truth of this scene when I saw uh, different videos of killing uh, two weeks after the scene. And this, these videos happened in occupied Palestine where two Israeli soldiers kill a Palestinian man also next to the street sign past either side. And this scene also was filmed by multiple cameras at the same time from different angles. So I start to think it's maybe the same production company that produced this footage, that they use the same props as well. Not only that, the idea that this scene was filmed by multiple cameras at the same time, um, each camera becomes a suspect of the killing. And each camera is trying to provide a proof that the other cameras are the murderers. So it becomes like a battlefield of image production which results in fictionalizing the scene. And fictionalizing doesn't necessarily mean uh, making it not real, but it means making it not true. In the film Close Up uh, by Abbas Kiarostami, maybe some of you have seen it, for the people who haven't, uh, it's basically the story of uh, Sabzian, which is a person who impersonates uh, the identity of a famous Iranian director called Mahmal Bov, and he tricks a family to make them believe that he will uh, make them act in his new film and he will use their home as location. Uh, of course, he gets arrested and then we, we see the trial in this film. The trial is actual documentation of the real trial, but the rest of the film is reenactment of the story and the reenactment. Uh, uh, the people who acted that are the same exact people who the story happened to. So it's a docu-fiction documentary or film. But in this scene we see uh, Sabzian, who was uh, fully convinced that he did not necessarily trick the family. He actually intended to show, uh, to, to shoot a film with them. And he even wrote notes on his notebook that he considered to somehow be a script. And before the arrest, in two hours, he wrote on his notebook the end. So he, in a kind of, he, he felt it. Um, for the judge, of course, this is for him his own imagination. And the, true, the truth, or the true truth, is determined by testimonies and, uh, and proofs, such as images. And uh, we can see also how truth is determined by the courtroom or the law and the investigation of forensic architecture. Forensic architecture is a research group that is based in Goldsmith in London. And in this investigation, they investigate the killing of a Palestinian man by Israeli soldiers. It's a different uh, happening. And they uh, base their investigation on many videos, photographs, uh, 3D modeling and time tra tra uh, tracking the time uh, and many other techniques to construct a coherent narrative that proves that the killing of Ahmad was extrajudicial, which means that it happened outside of the law. Um, of course, everyone knows the reality of, of what happened in that uh, event and the reality of so many similar events that keep happening in occupied Palestine. So the actual reality does not necessarily need a proof, but the truth does require a constructed narrative that uses images, for example, as forensic tools um, to, to prove something is, uh, is true. And that the truth here is the extrajudicial part, so that it happened outside the law, which is the law, of course, of the occupying force. So it's, it's not an eye that killed the Hezbollah fighter here. Uh, it's actually the sniper bullet that entered his body. And these cameras have captured the sniper bullet entering uh, his body, but they, are also they also captured the empty shell of the sniper bullet that fell next to the same street sign, past either side. And uh, these images that are produced, some of them, or many of them actually, are damaged images and they leak. 
So as they circulate, they start leaking stuff. That will show you uh, something. I'm going to um, the doctor to get my vitamin D. But I'm passing uh, next to the same street sign. from the videos I found something <laughs> So this is the actual empty shell that of the sniper bullet that killed the Hezbollah fighter, it leaked here in Arnhem, next to the same street sign. And if you like to feel it, I can give you a glove and then you can hold it and see. So, if anyone would like. Somebody else? Yeah? Come you can pass it and meanwhile you can also um, check the tracings and maybe peek at the photographs behind them and um, after that there will be a video playing on loop on the screen that you can watch throughout the whole day and the whole finals generally thank you <laughs>